Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for On the Inside, the logistics of providing services behind bars. My name is Carolina Aparicio, Communications Officer at JDI, and I'll be your moderator today. JDI is a health and human rights organization that seeks to end sexual violence, seeks to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. We have three core goals. First, to hold government officials and agencies accountable for sexual abuse in their facilities. To change flippant and unhelpful pub public attitudes about sexual violence behind bars. And finally, to ensure survivors of prisoner rape get the help they need. We would like to take a moment to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our larger project called No Bad, no Bad Victims, Support for Incarcerated Survivors. We'll talk about what other resources are available through that project for advocates later on in this webinar. So just a few things to, get, uh, to go over before we get started. Um, you can submit questions at, and comments at any time throughout the webinar using the questions box on the right side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you in the next few days along with a link to the evaluation. And I also want to mention that the recording will be closed captioned. This webinar will also be posted on the JDI website. Please make a note of the link on your screen. This web, this web page also hosts all of our previous webinars and many, many other resources for advocates. This webinar is the third part of a three-part series for advocates. The purpose of this series is to help community-based rape crisis organizations and other service providers like yourselves understand the issues facing survivors in adult and juvenile detention. We'll, we'll be devoting an entire webinar to the logistics of providing in-person counseling to incarcerated survivors and tune into that webinar on July 23rd. You can expect more information about that soon. Today's webinar will dis uh, during today's webinar, we'll discuss ways in which advocates can work with corrections agencies to create programs around providing services to incarcerated survivors in prisons, jails, community confinement, lockups, and youth detention facilities. Today, we'll cover the following. What types of services you can provide? The specific needs of incarcerated survivors? The unique role of rape crisis advocates as it relates to PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, including issues of liability and confidentiality. We'll also talk about, uh, we'll also have a first-hand account from a survivor of prisoner rape who will talk about the life-saving services he received. We'll talk about how to put together written agreements or a memoranda of understanding and about setting parameters. We'll cover the logistics of setting up services. We'll spend a little time going over funding options and other resources. And we'll end with some time for, um, to answer some of your questions. A quick note on some terms before moving on. We'll use the terms victim and survivor interchangeably during this webinar. JDI uses the term survivor to describe someone who's been sexually abused. We do this to honor the strength and resiliency it takes to live through a sexual assault and for that person to heal. Law enforcement, prosecutors, and victims' rights groups tend to use the term victim in recognition of the crime that was committed. We'll also use the terms um, inmates, residents, and detainees to refer to incarcerated people. The term inmate is used in the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards to refer to people who are uh, detained in a prison or jail. Resident is used for persons confined to a community confinement facility or juvenile facility. And detainee, or sometimes arrestee, is a term that's used for a person who's been arrested by a law enforcement officer and is detained in a lockup. If you have questions about a specific term, please use the questions box and a JDI staff member will assist you. The information that, we that we'll cover today can be found in JDI's guide called Hope Behind Bars, an Advocate's Guide to Helping Survivors of Sexual Abuse in Detention. We covered this guide in a great amount of detail during our last webinar, which can be viewed, along, uh, viewed online along with the printable guide um, on our Advocate Resources section of our, JDI, of our website, JDI website. Um, we certainly encourage you to download the guide for future reference and to share with your colleagues. I'd now like to introduce Vivian Hohola, a program director at JDI, to discuss different services survivor advocates can provide in confinement settings. Welcome, Vivian. 
Thank you, Carolina, and hello, everyone. Rape crisis centers can provide a variety of services to incarcerated survivors, including written correspondence through letter or emails. Letters are still the primary way that most inmates have contact with the outside world. Some facilities also allow for monitored email contact. Hotline calls. Some facilities are working with local rape crisis agencies now to provide access, or they're considering providing access to the local rape crisis hotline. Hospital accompaniment follow-up, in-person counseling in some settings, group counseling, and legal and systems advocacy. Today we'll go in, uh, we're going to go through the logistics of providing hotline and hospital accompaniment services. We'll focus on in-person services during our next uh, webinar, as Carolina, men Carolina mentioned. Of course, incarcerated survivors need some of the same things that any survivor needs. They need support. They need someone who believes them. They need validation, assurance that what they're feeling right now is normal, information about sexual assault, about their rights, healing, and the process of reporting if they choose to do so, advocacy, advocating for their needs with the hospital, the SANE, the corrections facilities, and others, and they need connection to the community. The advocate is critical to incarcerated survivors because every other professional that the inmate comes in contact with on a daily basis is a mandated reporter. The advocate is the one person whose only concern is the survivor's well-being and the only person who's required to maintain confidentiality. The Prison Rape Elimination Act that was passed in 2003 required there to be standards, a set of rules and guidelines that facilities must follow around inmate safety specifically to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment in corrections facilities. The standards were released in May of 2012 and they apply to prisons, jails, youth facilities, police lockups, and community confinement facilities. One of the key things that they do is they encourage corrections facilities to reach out to and work with local rape crisis and other victim services organizations. The Prison Rape Elimination Act standards also require that facilities provide a way for inmates or residents to contact local, state, or national agencies that provide emotional support regarding sexual abuse and sexual harassment via hotlines or mail and they must offer a way for inmates to report sexual abuse or harassment to an external, public, or private entity. The distinction between these two functions is really important. They're very, these are two different standards within the law and they serve different purposes. The outside reporting entity is so that inmates can report sexual abuse or sexual harassment to someone other than a staff member of the current facility. And the hotline for emotional support serves the same function for incarcerated people as it does for callers who are on the outside. Since corrections agencies are required to have both a way for prisoners to get emotional support services and to make a report to an outside entity, they may see the rape crisis hotline as the perfect solution to both of these. We'll talk a little more about this distinction later, but remember that corrections officials may see services as primarily for people who have made a report. You may have to explain that rape crisis services are for all survivors, regardless of the status of a report or how long ago the abuse occurred. Because reporting rates are still so very low, our response to sexual abuse and detention can't hinge on the few people who make an official report. It's important to understand that the PREA standards are not binding on rape crisis centers. They don't mandate anything of rape crisis centers. And they don't change the legal and ethical principles that guide rape crisis services. Some rape crisis programs have heard that PREA requires, requires them to report to the facility. This is not the case and it's a misunderstanding of the standards. PREA doesn't change a community agency's responsibilities to their clients or the scope of their services. On the other hand, all staff members who work in a corrections facilities, along with volunteers and contractors, are mandated reporters, which is again one reason that having access to a confidential advocate is so important. The standards don't affect other mandatory reporting requirements, including for rape crisis counselors working with incarcerated survivors. Your current policies around confidentiality apply. They don't change simply because of the place of, res of residence of the survivor. 
correction staff whose primary concern is the safety and security of the facility may have some difficulty understanding the clear, bright line that rape crisis advocates must draw around confidentiality. So be prepared to spend some time on this issue. Be clear with the corrections officials that the duty of rape crisis counselors is to maintain confidentiality. Discuss the benefits of confidential services with them and recognize that corrections concerns are real. Document confidentiality guidelines in written agreements, your MOUs. These two perspectives come from very different mandates. One being required to prove why you need to break confidentiality, the rape crisis advocates, versus being held liable if you don't report, corrections officials. These partnerships work best when these roles are clearly defined and preferably in writing. The corrections official's main concern is for the safety and security of the facility, and the rape crisis advocate's main concern is the safety and well-being of the survivor. These differing roles and perspectives are not mutually exclusive, and just as in a community SART, they can and do work together for a safer and healthier community. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, before we move on, I want to remind everyone to submit questions about any of the content we're discussing today using the questions box on the right side of your screen. So I'd now like to introduce Joe Booth, a survivor of sexual abuse in prison and a member of JDI's Survivor Council. Joe was sexually abused by his cellmate over the course of many days in a California state prison. He repeatedly asked for help. Um, and was, but was ignored until he was finally believed by one official and was given a forensic exam at an outside hospital. Joe's been out for several years now, and we've invited him here today to talk about what help he did receive and what advice um, he would give to advocates who are interested in working with incarcerated survivors. Welcome, Joe, and thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Joe, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in prison? Um, yeah, um, sure. Um, well, you know, my experience in prison was pretty extensive. I had spent quite a bit of time in prison and was pretty sure I knew how to handle myself or avoid bad people and stay away from situations that I couldn't deal with one way or another. I, uh, I was wrong. I was raped several times over a four-day period by my cellmate. That changes a person in ways that uh, nobody but a survivor of rape can truly understand. Mm, thank you, Joe. Um, and what made you decide to reach out for help? Can you tell us about that experience? Well, you know, I, I knew what had happened to me was wrong, and it was pretty damaging. As strong as I am and was, I was not strong enough to really deal with this on my own. So I started writing letters to everyone. I must have sat for eight hours a day for many days writing letters to you know, anybody with an organization abbreviation that might take me seriously. I received a few responses, four or five. One of these responses was from a sheriff <laughs> who told me, and I quote, you cannot file a charge of rape against an inmate is you yourself are an inmate and do not have that right. But I did receive two positive responses. One was from a rape crisis center. I can't tell you how important she, it, that first lady was just extremely important to me. And my healing. The other was uh, from Just Detention International. Can you tell us a little bit of, um, more about the services you received from, from JDI and then maybe from the advocate? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first thing JDI told me in their response was they believed me. <laughs> they told me that uh, I wasn't the one who had done wrong. but I was the one who had been wronged. Um, I remember that it was a, a handwritten letter <laughs> and it started with my first name. Wow. 
you can't know what that meant to me that somebody actually believed me. I thought to myself, all right, now I will fight. I ended up filing a lawsuit against the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations. But for me, it didn't matter whether I won or not. All that really mattered to me was that I was heard. Not only was I heard, but I ended up winning my lawsuit. It's not easy to stand up to a big entity like CDCR, but it's near impossible without believing in yourself. That's the biggest service I received, the strength to believe in myself. There are some other services I received, such as paper to write on and ideas as to where to look for case law and stuff like that, but bigger than all that, they simply said, hello, Joe. Hmm. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and can you tell us what was the most helpful, helpful thing while you were inside prison in terms of your healing? I think for me personally was, uh, you know, physical exercise. Uh, the more I worked out, the more I got mad. Then I was smart enough to turn that anger into my studies of the law in legal language. Thank you. I think that's really um, helpful and interesting to know that that, that, is, that was your coping skill. That's how you coped behind bars. Um, and so what help or support do you wish had been available to you now looking back? You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But, you know, looking back on the whole ordeal, I think the most helpful would, you know, if the institution itself could have done have more understanding of the issue of sexual abuse in general. Like what happens to a person when they are sexually abused? You know, individually or while in custody. If they had taken that a lot more seriously, it would have been a lot better for me. I was treated as a criminal by the institution. Uh, excuse me. If I had been treated as a human being, it would have given me, you know, a firmer ground to stand on. I think I would have been able to stay at that institution instead of being transferred to another one. And I believe I could have helped other survivors on a more individual level. Also, I think that I wish I'd, <clears throat> I wish they had stayed with me all the way through this remembering, pardon me, <laughs> Remembering the name of the first advocate who held my hand during the forensic exam and said, uh, Joe, are you all right? After being treated so harshly by a lot of people, her kindness really helped me through my healing. It still brings tears to my eyes. You know, the, the SART exam itself isn't very pleasant. Just to have somebody there holding your hand and telling you it's going to be okay, that really makes a difference. Thank you again, Joe. And um, just so you know, we're getting a lot of really wonderful and supportive comments for you, Joe, from, from people who are participating, just admiring your strength to tell your story. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. So have you continued to get help since you've been out of prison? Can you tell us a little bit what that's been like and what's been most helpful? Yeah, sure. So, you know, after I got out, I thought I would find good help. And at first I didn't. But I stayed in touch with JDI, and they pointed me to some resources that, by the way, my parole officer knew about but neglected to mention, even after I asked about it. It was this loyal to me that, the people at JDI and Buffy, that's the girl, my rape crisis counselor advocate. What an angel. And, and others showed me simply by addressing me as Joe. That gave me the strength to fight and fight the CDCR. That was the most helpful for me personally, that is. Um, also, I've been able to talk to other survivors, and that gives you a little bit of strength to know um, 
that you're, you know, you're not alone. Thank you, Joe. And I just got a comment saying that Buffy is also on here, and she's honored to have been part of your journey. She's listening. Um, so finally, just to kind of wrap this wrap this up, um, can you tell us maybe top the top three things you would like rape crisis counselors to know about working with survivors of sexual abuse and detention? You know, I've, I've been asked this question quite a few times, and I always give the same answer. The most important thing would be not to be afraid to shake my hand. Human contact is empowering to everybody, from you know, the weakest to the biggest and strongest. The second is to use my first name. In prison, we're almost always referred to by our inmate numbers or last names, even by other inmates. Addressed with my first name made me feel like a human being. Correction officers and cops won't like this, but, you know, you have the right, and it shows humanity to a rape victim. The third is listen to everything the survivor has to say, even if it has nothing to do with the rape. It very well may be a way for the victim to relax enough to say what is going on with them. I know it was for me. Joe, thank you so much for sharing your story and for your continued work and advocacy on behalf of incarcerated survivors. We are just so honored to have you on our, on our survivor council here. So um, just to give people a little bit more information, both JDI and the rape crisis advocate, Buffy, who saw Joe in the, or, sorry, the, the, the advocate who saw Joe in the hospital continue to provide support for him, uh, to him via letter. And the rape crisis advocate offered to come and see him in person, but she wasn't allowed into the prison. Joe was transferred to another prison, and she was able to arrange follow-up sessions then. Joe's consistently credited these follow-up services with how well he's doing since leaving prison. Um, so we've asked Joe to uh, to stay for the question and answer session, and I'm seeing a few answer a few questions already. Um, so if you if you all can submit those questions um, that you have for him using the questions box on the right side of your screen, we'll we'll ask them. We'll ask Joe to answer some of those at the end. Um, and thanks again, Joe. So I just want to reiterate some of the key points that Joe just made. Um, we heard from Joe that just having a compassionate witness who believed him made all the difference in his healing. From that very first advocate who held his hand during the forensic exam to the advocate he received follow-up sessions from. And then also having a connection with the outside world re restored Joe's sense of humanity. He talked a lot about that. And then feeling validated and being told that his reaction to the experience of being sexually abused was completely normal and just the mere fact of being believed really helped him. And finally, I think the major lesson from Joe's story is that some support is far better than none. Again, just getting a positive written response after he had written to dozens of, of organizations and just getting that couple positive written responses from, from, those, from two people made an enormous difference in Joe's recovery. So I want to move, let's move on now into a discussion uh, of on written agreements or memoranda of understanding or MOUs and the parameters of providing services. So as Vivian discussed earlier, pre, the PREA standards require corrections facilities to attempt to enter into MOUs with rape crisis centers. And I'm, I'm almost positive a, a, a large per percentage of you um, attendees are getting some of these requests. Um, so in your written agreements with facilities, it's important to describe the commitments of each party. Will your agency be contacted immediately after a report of a sexual assault? What kinds of services will you provide? Hotline calls, in-person counseling, hospital accompaniment. So it's really important to lay that out specifically. Include any deal breakers. One such deal breaker might be your agency's absolute commitment to confidentiality. Or maybe the facility wants you to arrive at a SART site within, let's say, an hour after you're called, but that's just not feasible for you if you live several hours away, for example. Allow for flexibility. The process, this, this process of writing a, an agreement may take some time. You'll have to have conversations around things that aren't deal, deal breakers. For example, here at JDI, when we started providing in-person in services at a California facility, we wanted to be face-to-face. -face. 
but that wasn't a possibility. Just the facility for security reasons would not allow it. So our staff ended up meeting with survivors through an enclosed cell and it, it, it worked. So it's important to understand the perspective of the other parties and work with them to be able to be, be there for survivors, just as long as you're not giving up that you are the advocate. Always fight for the survivor, but don't be so rigid that it could impede on your ability to serve survivors in the end. And then finally, be reflective of the process. Write the MOU in such a way that the next person might be able to understand how you got there. Make sure the content is rich enough so that the people who are involved in the process don't have to be the ones carrying it out. So let's look at one specific MOU. Um, we're going to use this example from Bar Barnwell County in South Carolina, their jail, and the Rape Crisis Center in Cumbie, South Carolina, which is close by. And the, um, this MOU was drafted by Cynthia Totten, um, one of our program directors here at JDI. This MOU will be made available on our website. If you want to go over it more carefully, we're just going to kind of do broad strokes here. Um, so the MOU describes what looks like looks a lot like a coordinated approach, much like you would have with a sexual assault response team or a SART. It's written in a way that makes sure the survivor gets the care and advocacy that he or she needs from all parties involved. You'll notice that the encircled section on the screen lays out who responds, the timeline for the response, and how the Rape Crisis Center and Corrections Facility work together for the well-being of the survivor. Similarly, um, this section that's encircled on the second slide um, covers the Rape Crisis Agency's responsibilities. It outlines how they'll learn about a survivor who needs help, the services that they'll provide, and which includes emergency services and follow-up, and specifically says, as their resources allow. Including that phrase was very important to, that, to this specific Rape Crisis Center in Cumbie, and it, this also specifies that the agency must follow facility guidelines for safety, and security, um, which my co colleague Linda will go over in more detail shortly. And of course, it includes the confidentiality component. So thinking about the MOU we just reviewed, um, which is the foundation document of the Survivor Services Program within the Barnwell County Jail, let's take a look at what they did. They considered both what was needed by the jail and the survivors in their facility, and what the Rape Crisis Program was able to provide given their resources. Start with crisis services. Early intervention is incredibly important. As you heard from Joe, one positive supportive interaction can make a huge difference in a survivor's experience. Crisis services, meaning um, hospital or accompaniment during a forensic exam, and some level of hotline or other crisis in intervention services are a good place to start. Develop a multi-phased plan. Think about where you would like to be in the future. If you can't provide your absolute best model of complete services right away, that really doesn't mean you can't still help survivors, and that doesn't have to mean the end. Maybe develop a plan to raise funds, and we'll go over a little bit of that later on today. Um, you can recruit volunteers, you can, and you can add services, such as follow-up or in-person counseling as your resources allow. Consider the needs of survivors. Again, think about Joe. As Joe said, the basis of providing a com compassionate witness, learning that you're not alone, and learning about healing and that it wasn't your fault, are still the basic needs of survivors. Of course, people who are incarcerated may have a variety of needs, you know, legal aid, um, et cetera, but that doesn't mean you have to meet all of those needs. Finally, think creatively. Sometimes there won't be an ideal place to provide confidential counseling, or maybe the facility phone system isn't immediately co compatible with your own hotline system. Or maybe you just can't spare a staff member to work in your local corrections facility. This is where you have to think outside the box. Is, this, is there a volunteer in the community who maybe has done this work before, who's already volunteering with you, with your agency? Um, one project that JDI worked on, um, it turned out that the Rape Crisis Center had a volunteer who was a retired psychiatric nurse who had worked in the local mental health facility. It turned out she was the perfect person to serve incarcerated survivors. So those are just um, some thoughts. And I, I'd like to now turn to Linda McFarlane, JDI, one of JDI's deputy executive directors, to explain specific details you'll want, to work, you'll want worked out with the facility you're working with. Um, as you set up your programs, including hotline calls and hospital accompaniment. Linda, over Thank to you. you. Thanks, Carolina. Thanks so much. Um, 
as you all know, hotlines are the foundation of rape crisis services. Uh, it's the first service that most places offered. It's still the entry point for most survivors to the agency and the place where many survivors say out loud for that very first time what happened to them. Hotlines save lives and the fact that more and more incarcerated survivors have the ability to call one is incredibly exciting. But it also does require some careful planning and setup. As we mentioned earlier, corrections agencies might reach out to you or may already have to ask to provide hotline services in their facility because the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards require them to. They might not have had a lot of contact with rape crisis program before and they might not be aware of how your services work. So don't assume a baseline of knowledge about what your agency does in the community. Be prepared to explain your role in the community, how you work with law enforcement, your services, and definitely the function of the hotline. Let's just talk a little bit about the logistics and how some of this works. I think one of the real challenges is just figuring out the setup to begin with and advanced planning is so important. Uh, people in facilities, prisoners can't just walk up to a phone necessarily like someone in the community can and make a call. They might have to make collect calls or more often now it's a sort of changing use a PIN number or purchase calling cards. So get to know the phone system, ask the people at the corrections agency that you're working with what it's like, how does it work, how can it work with your service. If there is a PIN number, should the corrections facility, I mean, would the corrections facility be willing to program it into the system so that there is no cost. If you have a voicemail that people have to get through first, is that even possible from the prison phone system? Also find out when survivors can make such calls. It's likely that there are limited phone hours in, in most many corrections facilities, not everyone. So perhaps you don't need a 24-hour coverage. Um, here at JDI, we've worked with several facilities that provide a hotline for specific hours when prisoners can actually make calls. And this has really helped with coverage, with planning, and with assigning staff members or volunteers who are expecting and, and ready and willing and trained to take calls from the corrections facility. When you're doing this setup, consider asking how attorney calls are made. Facilities need to provide this for lawyers. They need to provide confidential free contact for um, people to get to their lawyers. And that system, however they're doing that, could also be an option for you. I want to just mention quickly that the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision has already issued a directive that calls to the rape crisis centers that they've agreed to work with are in the exact same category as attorney calls. So it's certainly something that's a possibility. Vivian touched on this a bit ago, but remember to distinguish between the counseling hotline and the reporting line that corrections facilities have to provide. Work with the facility to make sure that, that accurate information is provided to staff and prisoners about the hotline and its purpose. Um, talk with the facility about their safety concerns as well. They might be consider, concerned that hotline counselors will conference in a prisoner's family members, might be easily manipulated to help prisoners break rules, or will also develop unprofessional relationships. Some of this is based on not understanding the training that most rape crisis programs go through and what you're already dealing with in the community in terms of sorting out boundaries and what your services are for. So, but still listen carefully to those concerns and train your advocates on the rules of that facility. Confidentiality is, of course, the cornerstone of rape crisis services. Um, the ability to have a completely confidential, often anonymous call with a person who will be that compassionate witness, who will believe, who will provide information, and assist with problem solving, all things you heard Joe touch on, is invaluable to survivors. So it's a good idea to take a tour of the facility. You'll hear us say this sort of again and again so you understand where people are living, what conditions, where they are. Where are the phones? Is there a safe place to call a hotline from? Is it possible to make a private call at all? Um, are there other options if it's not? Most phone systems inside corrections facilities are monitored, so find out who can listen to the calls or recordings. Some facilities live monitor them, 
um, and sort of randomly listen in. Others record them and randomly listen to recordings or might targeted listen to recordings if they have a safety concern about a particular person. Um, so it's important to know, is there some way for a particular number not to be listened to like attorney calls? I already mentioned the New York State Department of Corrections. There will be specific numbers that go to rape crisis centers that are not going to be monitored. Um, similar, JDI works with Miami-Dade County Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Similarly, there's a hotline that goes right to the Roxy Bolton Rape Treatment Center, and that hotline is a confidential private free number that's been programmed into the inmate phone system. Another, another example of one where it wasn't so simple is in Kern County, California, where we're working with the Kern County Jail and Women's Center High Desert, and there they automatically record every single call, but calls to certain numbers, such as to attorneys or to the complaint lines, um, are not listened to. They can tell where those recordings come from, and so that was a similar agreement with the Rape Crisis Center, that those the calls that are made to the rape crisis hotline will not be listened to unless the um, director of the rape crisis program makes a request in writing based on a release of information that they have received from a client because that client wants um, that recording to be listened to as a part of an investigation. Reporting is going to come up a great deal. Both staff members and prisoners will have questions about reporting. And what you'll do if you hear of a new assault. So again, it's really important to be clear about confidentiality guidelines. Another question that comes up a great deal is, what if a prisoner wants help in making a report? Think about, is that something your agency can do? What would you do if a survivor who lives in the community asks for you to call the police for them? What do you do? Um, do you do that for them, or do you provide them with the information they need to make that report themselves? If you ever do make a third party report for someone on behalf of a survivor, do you require a written or witnessed release of information? How do you, how do you manage that? Um, so really thinking about how you would handle that for other survivors and applying those same principles to incarcerated survivors is what we'd recommend. So if the facility insists that they won't work with you if you don't commit to making a report regarding anyone who calls, to talk to you about recent abuse or abuse that happened in the facility. And this is definitely something we've heard from um, rape crisis centers across the country. I think it's then it's time to sit down with your contact at the facility, with the management, with the people who are working on this program, and talk about it. It, it might be based on a lack of understanding of the advocate's role. Um, and it might also, they may have the impression that if a survivor can reach out to you without making a report, that then they're going to look at less reports. And so it's important for you to be able to talk through this with them and explain that when survivors have appropriate, confidential support, they're more likely to feel safe to report and more likely to be able to stick with the investigation. I mean, I think you heard this from Joe, right? That, that once he got some support, he felt much more able to participate in the process, to um, bring it to the attention to the department by submitting a lawsuit, and really a lot of that was based on knowing that he wasn't alone and that somebody was there with him. And I just want to mention again, I heard that the rape crisis advocate um, who worked with Joe Buffy is, is listening and, and just to say that that's the center for, was the Center for Community Solutions in San Diego and we want to thank them for their consistent support of incarcerated survivors. All right, so things can go well, there can also be challenges. So what do you do when there's, when there's challenges? I think a lot of rape crisis programs are really concerned about a volume of calls increasing dramatically. And certainly, a lot of rape crisis programs that have provided hotlines um, have had some of these challenges. And I think most of the ones that I've been aware of have been able to work through. And also, some of them can really be avoided with good advanced planning. I think the first thing is to expect off topic and, and even sometimes prank or crank calls and have a plan to respond. First off, you heard Joe mention that the person, the incarcerated survivor, might really need to talk through 
some other issues, some how things are going, conditions at the prison perhaps, both to help them build trust with you and to help them relax. And it's, so it's important that your advocates be able to sort out when a survivor needs to do that to kind of test is this a safe person and when it's really an off topic call and someone's calling just to chat. And again, these are issues you deal with callers from the community as well, right? So remember that you already know how to do this. Um, but it, it is critical that you make sure that your resources are used appropriately, right? Prisoners do have a variety of concerns, and oftentimes they have very, very few resources and very few people who respond to them. So, you know, if someone writes to 50 people and two people write back, even if this isn't what you do, the person is of course going to ask you for help around particular issues. So it's important to train advocates how to rant, manage this on a hotline and make a plan over time. I mean ahead of time. It's important to respond respectfully, but also make sure that you are using your resources for survivors of sexual assault, which is your mission. Think about how you train hotline advocates to respond to other off-topic or prank calls. Handle it the same way. The same strategies will work. Um, with prisoners as well. Also, what, what if there's a problem on the facility? Some example, I mean, on the hotline. Um, some examples might be if it's being used to an extent that you really can't maintain. Um, also, what if, for example, you receive a threatening or a series of inappropriate calls? And, and I'll be honest with you, with the facilities that we've worked with, there has been concern ahead of time about threatening calls and um, this is not something that's been a major concern in any of the hotlines I've been aware of. But again, plan ahead because if you don't, that's when the problem will happen, right? So I think the best plan is to have a specific contact person that you can talk to about concerns. And it might be that materials for staff or inmates about the hotline need to be revised if there's a lot of misuse of the hotline. It might be that there is just one person who's misusing the hotline and that person alone needs to be dealt with. Um, and it also might be that your advocates could use some support or additional training in dealing with cutting off um, inappropriate calls. Another concern we've heard is that what if you find out that prisoners are not being allowed to use the hotline? I think first it's important to figure out why. Um, maybe the phones aren't working. Maybe the PIN number is not activated. And I think these are technology fixes and something to just inform the facility about. If prisoners are actively being discouraged from using it um, or it's unsafe for some reason, then it's important to go back to your counseling, to your contact person rather. There might be a need for more inmate education, staff training. Um, if someone's directly threatening inmates about using it, either an inmate or a staff member, they should be dealt with um, through disciplinary channels. And it's, again, important to go back to that, contact, to that contact person. I think a lot of these challenges might require a revisiting of your MOU and see if there's any tweaks that need to be made as well. If you hear about retaliation, for someone actually using the hotline, people being harassed, abused, threatened because they have reached out for services, and again, either by other prisoners or by staff members, again, super important to follow up with that contact person to find out what is actually happening in the facility. Um, and I think this really would be something that you could describe without breaking an individual survivor's confidentiality um, by saying things like, we've heard concerns that, um, we have been married aware of incidences where someone's been threatened and really talk about it more in general terms because I think if that's being allowed to go on, it's really a system-wide or facility-wide problem um, that needs to be addressed. Certainly love to take, again, we'll take questions around hotline calls specifically, but we're going to move on to hospital accompaniment now. Um, remember, of course, that the first, the reactions of the first few people that a survivor tells have the big, biggest impact on their healing. You heard Joe earlier talk about having a rape crisis counselor at the hospital, and even just the fact that she called him by his first name, humanized the experience, validated that he was a survivor, and let him know that he wasn't alone here. And so being there during a forensic exam to explain the process, provide information about healing, and provide support through this really difficult process is another foundational rape crisis service. 
the setup for this. Again, I think it should take some time. There should be um, a little bit of effort invested in here. It is entirely possible that the organization that you're working with on accompaniment for incarcerated survivors to forensic exams is already on a community sexual assault response team with you. If you have it, that will make it a lot easier. A lot of the processes and procedures really should be the same and in many cases in that case it's really only confirming that this same response is for incarcerated survivors. Um, but on the other hand, because involvement in the community SART is new for many corrections agencies, and also because some might be in locations where honestly there is no sexual assault response team, it's important to pay attention, careful attention to planning, make sure that people aren't operating on assumptions. So the first question might be to ask is where are the exams going to be done? The majority will be at the SART site or at the hospital or other community SART, wherever forensic exams, any forensic exam would be conducted. Um, some facilities are looking at or have a, I've already developed a mobile SART response so that the exams can be conducted in the facility. There's definitely pros and cons to this. One of the pros could be um, that the survivor doesn't have to be shackled and taken out. Um, and possible loss of evidence and additional time. Um, and a con is more difficulty of involving the advocacy agency. So it's, if it's the case where there's a mobile SART, it's important to figure out how the advocacy service is included. Many corrections facilities don't realize that rape crisis services are often not included in the cost of the forensic exam or in the SANE program, and that the rape crisis advocate might not be able to travel to the facility. So talk this through and work on a plan for what it would take for you to be able to get there. Find out if the transport's taking place to the forensic exam. Find out who'll transport the survivor and what agency is going to do the investigation. It might be the agency you're already working with on a SART again. It may be the agency that runs the corrections facility or a separate police agency like a city police department. Just as you would with a community SART, figure out who notifies whom. What's the phone tree look like? If the corrections agency is getting ready to transport a survivor for an exam, do they call the forensic examiner and then who calls the advocate? Make that all very clear. Check in about what's the response time. What time makes sense? Um, just as in the community, it's important to minimize the time the survivor is sitting waiting. Remember also that the survivor from a prison, jail, or lockup and potential youth facility might, well, is likely to be shackled and cuffed and might be very uncomfortable waiting for a long time in an ER. It's important to take a look at the actual site before you start doing accompaniment so that you can figure out where the team will gather to exchange information. Um, to help correction staff plan for security and see where an advocate can meet with the survivor privately. Remember that your role never changes. It's always to watch out for the survivor's comfort and well-being. But as well, the correction staff's role is to maintain safety and security. And so the point of the SART approach here and the advanced planning is to strike a balance between these two. The challenges of maintaining confidentiality in an exam site are similar with other law enforcement, where they may wish to know the content of your conversations, um, be present for some of your conversations, but on the other hand, with corrections with incarcerated survivors, it's more intense in that staff members may be more uncomfortable with you meeting with the survivor or unwilling, unwilling to allow you to meet privately. Again, this is another place where advanced planning is critical. Talk with your contact person at the facility. Make sure you and the facility have an understanding of where a meeting could happen and how you will talk to security staff about it, but also what training security staff that are going to be transporting people will get about the advocate's role. All corrections agencies have to provide training to staff on their coordinated response, in other words, how the facility will work together to respond to sexual assault. And so their work with the advocacy organization should be part of that training. And if you're that advocacy organization, you should definitely be providing some content um, about that. 
Plan ahead in terms of what information you're going to need from facility staff on site. You generally won't need more than you do for any survivor, maybe age, identifying information, basics of what happened and when. And staff at the facility might believe they need to tell you why the person was arrested or other details of their behavior in the facility. But unless it's directly relevant to your services at the hospital, you can respectfully say that you don't need that information. Um, this again will help to, for the survivor to help them know that you see them as a full, complete, complex human being. That's more than the fact that they're an incarcerated person. Think as well about what you provide in terms of information to the officers. They should know how to get in touch with you and basics about your services, again, similar to other survivors you work with. So what if a survivor tells you something that's important to the case in the context of a private crisis session? Our general counsel here would be that your services don't change based on where the survivor lives. So if it's not something you would tell police or other law enforcement, then it's not something you would tell correction staff. Think about what are your guidelines around confidentiality. Know them and follow them. Who's going to be in the room with the survivor during the exam is, is a, again, it's a little bit more of a complex um, calculation for incarcerated survivors. Um, to look at the room, is there room for you and the SANE and the survivor and potentially a corrections officer? What if that officer needs to be in the room? Um, so find out ahead of time again, this is the, the advanced planning we keep talking about from the facility, who's going to need to be in the room in terms of security. Do they need constant secure supervision? It often depends on both the approach of the corrections facility and the security level of the victim. We've, JDI has definitely worked on projects where the corrections agency is able to say that the majority of people they might bring out um, do not need um, to have sort of at arm's length supervision by the security staff, that that security staff can be in hearing and sight range, but, uh, but far enough to allow for some privacy. And we've heard from others that, nope, sorry, we have to be right there all the time. So, but it is important for you to know going in that not every corrections facility requires staff to be inside the room with the survivor at all times. Same thing with law enforcement interviews. Plan ahead with the agency around their officer's conduct at the exam site. They should be trained in what the role of the advocate is, what the role of the SART, um, the forensic examiner is, what the role of outside law enforcement is, and how to handle the privacy of the survivor. It's possible that the survivor might be um, classified as a high security inmate and that the transport officer is required to provide constant and close supervision. They, in that case, work with them to continue to advocate for the survivor. Be respectful of their role and what's required for them at all times, but also clear that you will need some time to speak with the survivor. And we'll talk a minute more in a minute more about that. Um, so again, if you're able to work with the facility to develop training for staff who are involved in the response to sexual abuse, like again, you might with other law enforcement doing roll call trainings or participating in their academy training, um, it's important to help them understand the needs of survivors and your role again. Reinforce that, that this approach, this teamwork approach, really yields most, the most complete investigations and the best criminal justice outcomes. The tour and bringing corrections officials along for a tour of the SART or SANE or SAFE site is critical so that they can ask questions and think about their needs ahead of time. Um, and so that they can assess whether it's possible for custody staff to supervise the prisoner without being in the exam room. They're going to look at, are there external windows? Is there an escape concern? Is it possible to have all sharp objects out of reach? How, you know, where are the forensic nurse um, storing and keeping their instruments during the exam? Um, so, Thinking about these things and going through them ahead of time are some of the things that might make the facility feel better about having an officer standing just outside the room. Um, I've toured several facilities with correction staff and worked about how this is going to be possible. If it's not possible for the corrections officer to be right outside the door, either because of the setup of the room, security level of the prisoner, ask for a privacy curtain, or at the very least make sure that the officer 
you, the advocate, and any other non-medical personnel stand near the survivor's head. And again, be constantly evaluating and looking at how can the survivor be the most comfortable and have the most privacy in this process. When a corrections agency takes someone outside of their facility, um, that can be a very, feel like it's a very high risk event for them when they take someone out for any reason and, and their concern is going to be security and safety of the community at that point which certainly raises the stakes for them so it's it's important to talk with them about that also to be respectful and understanding of that um, and to make sure you talk with them about what other security needs are present remember that the survivor is probably going to be handcuffed or shackled or both and as the, as the advocate for that person, it is okay to ask if they need to be throughout that whole exam and interview. I think this is another thing that's important to talk about before you start the program, and this critical point of the balance between safety and security and survivor comfort well-being is key here. Um, you might already, in your work, be providing accompaniment to incarcerated survivors, and so this might be more of an opportunity to fine-tune your approach rather than starting a whole new relationship. An example around the cuff and shackle issue that you could bring up is say if the survivor is cuffed at the wrist to the exam table, are other restraints, leg or waist restraints, actually necessary? Can they be removed? Um, it's important to include the forensic examiner in this conversation in terms of what are the needs of freedom of movement for the survivor and of course what physically needs to be done during the exam will have an impact on on the physical the freedom of movement of the survivor just like with the hotline there certainly can be some challenges in providing hospital accompaniment um, and I want to take a step back to times when a corrections agency arranges for an on-site forensic response and the advocate um, maybe can't get there and it's certainly a concern that I've observed isn't always brought up right away that sir this is best this is safest and then oh wait a minute that means the advocate can't come and so if this is the case it's what's really important I think for the rape crisis program is to stay in the conversation with the facility and with other sexual assault response team members. Um, some of the things to ta think about are, is it possible to work out a mileage fee? Um, possible, perhaps, to negotiate a fee for service with the unit of government that oversees the facility, whether that's city, county, or state? Some facilities and rape crisis centers that we've been aware of have worked together to propose a budget line item to the county or city budget. Um, and I'd say for now, at least, if you can't get the, to the facility, you can't physically get there, um, and they're doing the exams inside, and it's going to take time to secure funding or work out another arrangement, find a volunteer who could do that, perhaps. Find out, can you provide support and information through the hotline or a prearranged call before and or after the forensic exam? Do you have access to telemedicine, Skype? I think more and more facilities, particularly in rural areas, are using these kinds of technologies to help. All right, what if the corrections officer insists that rape crisis counselor can't meet privately with the survivor? And I think anyone who's worked in a, start, in a sexual assault response team, especially that's new, is getting set up, has probably addressed this concern uh, with law enforcement in, in the past. I know when I worked at a rape crisis center, we certainly did sometimes have to insist that no, the survivor has the right to an advocate, and it's actually their decision who's in the room throughout this process. And again, just like that with other advocacy, Talk with the partners on the team. What, what's, what, why is it? Are they concerned about your safety? Or maybe the corrections officer doesn't understand your role? Plan ahead about what you'll do um, if you ever do feel unsafe or concerned that the survivor is not stable. And talk with your partners and the team about that ahead of time so that they know there actually is a plan. Um, I had the opportunity to provide services at a men's prison uh, for over a year, and I can honestly say that I never felt unsafe with a client. Um, that said, we had a plan. I carried a whistle. I maintained close contact with my facility contact person when I was ever providing services, and I received training from the facility about how to respond in an emergency. I mentioned again earlier that we work closely with the Miami-Dade Department of Corrections in conjunction with the Roxy Bolton Rape Treatment Center and they transport survivors there for forensic exams 
on a regular basis and the advocate is able to meet privately with the survivor because they've taken the time to build, build trust, to develop their written agreements and um, their protocols for how to do these calls and to identify a room that works for both the rape crisis program and the, the jail for this purpose. If there really isn't a place that's secure for a private meeting, then assess whether there's a way for the officer to be standing far enough away um, or for you and the survivor to be behind a privacy screen so that you can still meet quietly with the survivor. Remember that the support that you can provide, even if it's not ideal, is going to be better than nothing. Um, one thing that's come up in a couple places if, is if the forensic examiner insists that all incarcerated survivors must remain fully shackled because they're concerned about their safety. And I'd say if that happens in the moment, just as you might not about other disagreements between the SART members, don't get into a confrontation at the site in front of the survivor. I'd say table this one for a further discussion. Remember, your role is to always take care of the needs of the survivor and challenging the nurse who's about to do their exam in front of them is not going to make them more comfortable most likely. So again, facilitate a discussion about what the concerns are and how to balance safety with survivor needs. If there's a concern on site, an escape attempt, an aggressive or out of control survivor, um, what do you do then? I'd say if there are any safety concerns for you or for the community, that's where you simply you step back and you defer to the corrections officials, to the custody staff, to the law enforcement um, that are on site as you would in other types of emergencies and you follow their instructions. I'm going to move again. I know that certainly funding and resources is, of course, is a, is a primary concern of rape crisis programs. Rape crisis programs are already struggling to provide services to the communities, their communities with the resources that they have now. Um, and for some centers, working with incarcerated survivors feels like a whole new program. And, and honestly, for many that we've worked with as well, it doesn't. That, that through the perspective that these are survivors, they're in our community, so it's an obvious population to serve. And some of that, honestly, I think depends on how many corrections officials, corrections facilities and what type of corrections facilities are located in the community. We'll go through some of the possible funding um, resources and, and again with the caveat that we understand that there isn't one simple easy answer to this and so going through these is in no means um, meant to minimize the challenge here. So Office of Victims of Crime, OVC has provided grants over the past several years that fund services for underserved populations of which prisoners are one and have been allowed to be uh, included as one. So keep an eye out for grants like that. Most of you are aware on the other hand, that the Victims of Crime Act still contains restrictions, a restriction rather, on using OVC formula grants to serve incarcerated survivors. Removing that restriction was one of the proposed changes in VOCA's last reauthorization. Um, the comment period was last summer and the final disposition has not been released. Um, and of course we won't know exactly what will happen then, but it's, it's certainly our impression that comments were quite favorable to that end. Um, Office of Violence Against Women or VAWA funds can be used for incarcerated survivors, particularly STOP grants. And of course you, could, you should check with your program officer for any specific restrictions on your state or agency funds um, before using them specifically for a new program. The Bureau of Justice Assistance um, has issued multiple grants each year over the past decade for the purpose of implementing the Prison Rape Elimination Act and its standards. These grants go directly to corrections agencies and in many jurisdictions they have included rape crisis programs in the grant as contractors. So that's another thing to kind of keep an eye out for and it's a possible um, source of funding in the future. Contracts are another place to think about negotiating a contract with the corrections agency and that can be the quickest way to work through funding if they can do it of course. It's the, the cost of basic services would be fairly low compared to most corrections facilities overall budgets. Um, could also be a set fee. I've worked with some places that have done that. Um, 
I worked with one agency where we were able to negotiate an additional fee for the rape crisis program to be included in the cost of the forensic exam. Um, and again, I'm not saying this is an easy fix and they might come back with, sorry, we don't have the budget, but it is certainly worth a discussion at any rate and certainly um, to look at advanced planning. Private and community foundations should be explored as well because this could, could be presented as a new program and has a great potential for improving public health of the community. It also reaches some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, so the potential for foundation funding is certainly there. A county measure would obviously be a longer term project, but could be an opportunity for um, public education as well and a ballot measure or other county measure could be included to provide additional funding to rape crisis programs in the community. I want to just take a moment before we move to questions um, and wrap up to talk about compassion fatigue specifically when it relates to serving incarcerated survivors. I mean, I know most many of you are aware of this. This is something that I think as, um, as a field we're getting a lot better at talking about um, in terms of being aware of your own limits and boundaries, practicing self-care, um, not saying yes to everybody, and um, taking time to really uh, pay attention to your own well-being when you're doing this work. So you can stick in it in the long haul because, because survivors need us to. Um, and I think with incarcerated survivors, it's, it's so important to be prepared for very challenging questions and grueling stories. I, I'd been doing work with survivors of sexual assault for nearly two decades when I started working at JDI, and I had thought I had heard it all, and I'll tell you I had not. Um, some of the things that incarcerated survivors have gone through um, were, were still shocking to me, uh, were still very difficult to hear. And of course, you have to take care of yourself and be prepared so that you don't um, let survivors know that what they're telling you is, is, is shocking and horrifying to you so that they don't feel that you can't contain it, right? That's, that's one of the critically important pieces of you have to be able to hear it, right? You have to not be shocked and say, oh my goodness, that's the worst thing I ever heard because then survivors will feel like you can't help them, you can't hear it. Um, so be prepared for that. Be prepared to listen. The other thing is, is that You've, I think you've heard all of us mention that, that survivors who are incarcerated may have very limited access to resources. And so the amount that you can really help may feel small to you. But again, I want to go back to Joe and, and his point that being humanized, being validated, being listened to, being believed were the things that had the most impact on him and that let him to find other ways to take care of himself. So exercising, continuing to fight, and I know that, that he's shared with us many times that having the opportunity to speak on webinars like this and know he's helping other survivors by doing that is also a critically important part of his healing. So to anticipate that you can't do everything for incarcerated survivors that you could do for survivors in the community, but what you do do um, will allow those survivors to go on. Again, we hear at JDI that just writing back a letter to someone um, can save their lives. We, we hear it all the time. Um, I think another piece is in terms of safety planning. We, we did talk about that a little bit on our last webinar, if people want to view that, that, that a survivor might be in constant contact with the perpetrator depending on their situation and if they've reported or not and or how the facility has responded. And so, you know, that survivor, you can't suggest that they go to a shelter. You can't suggest that they go stay at a friend's house for a week. You have to um, work with them around other ways to keep themselves safe, their brains, their hearts, and their bodies. Um, so it's important to know that that you may feel helpless at times in this work, but you also, um, the little bit that you can do will 
will possibly be able to help a lot. I want to note that Joe just sent a comment that, that for his case, he had to report um, before the advocate could get involved. And again, that, that is often the case in many facilities. And that's a lot of what PREA, the standards are working to change, is that, that you can then provide help through a hotline to people who maybe haven't reported like you do for other survivors. Um, and in that case, what you may be able to do to advocate directly if the survivor does not feel safe to report is, is again, even further limited. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Carolina to do the wrap-up and so that we can leave plenty of time for questions. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, so I just want to, uh, much, I just want to let people know that much of what we discussed today is included in JDI's publication, which I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, Hope Behind Bars, an Advocate's Guide to Helping Survivors of Sexual Abuse Behind Bars. Um, it's free and it's on the same page as about a dozen archived webinars on all types of topics from, you know, working in rural small jails to large urban, urban um, facilities or prisons and different, working with different um, populations. Um, and you'll also find lots and lots of fact sheets and um, a SART toolkit with, which has several sample MOUs for different kinds of facilities among other kind of sample um, documents for you to, to look at. And you can also submit questions. Um, and finally, you can also submit questions and requests for assistance on JDI's website. Um, those we, through our uh, Office on Violence Against Women um, grant, we we can kind of help advocates in the field remotely. So um, finally, more resources are available on the PREA Resource Center's website, um, which is up here on the on the site. I mean, on the on the slide. So now let's turn to some of your questions. Um, I, we are getting a lot of great questions, and I want to start with um, one for Linda. Um, this is from Jessica, and it says, does PREA mandate rape crisis centers um, staff and volunteers to attend trainings? We're being told by our county juvenile detention center that all counselors who have face-to-face -face meetings with youth must attend a training per PREA. That is a great question, Jessica. And so, I mean, I, in a way, it depends on what your role in the facility is. So PREA mandates that all staff members volunteers and contractors of the facility um, receive training and that should be appropriate to the level of, sort of a contact that they have with inmates. PREA also requires that medical and mental health staff of the facility receive specialized training. Um, PREA does not require that community agencies that are providing services receive the agency's PREA training. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a qualified answer because if you are a regular volunteer within the facility, then PREA does require that you receive their volunteer training. In most cases, that should be fairly simple, fairly short, um, around what do you do, what do you do if you um, if you hear of a report, what are the agency policies? Um, so again, it should depend a little bit, but the PREA standards are, man, are binding on corrections facilities, not on community agencies that provide services. Great, thank you, Linda. And then just um, one more question on, to piggyback on Jessica's question, does PREA require ongoing continuing education training? For staff of the corrections facility, yes. So all staff are supposed to, um, all staff are required to receive training, and there's about 11 points that they have to be trained on, and um, then the staff also have to receive refresher training, and certainly any training if any policies or procedures, um, policies or procedures are are updated. Oh, and it says, and, then, and for rape crisis advocates, they want to know about continuing no, education. No, PREA doesn't require anything of rape crisis advocates at all. Um, PREA is not binding on community programs. Right. So your same continuing education requirements that you might have to maintain your status as a certified agency or as a, a qualified agency in your state have not changed. 
Okay. Great. And um, so our next question, I have a question for Joe. Um, from, um, from actually a couple questions. Um, one from Jen, who asks, what resources did JDI give you? Um, you know, the biggest thing that JDI did was uh, start giving me places where I could look for my fight. Once I decided to fight, JDI told me that, uh, you know, what case law, what books to look in, what type of cases to look up for. They couldn't point me to exact terminology or stuff like that, but they, they gave me general direction. And um, aside from that, uh, you know, I got a Christmas card every, <laughs> I got a Christmas card every Christmas. That was cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. And then, so here's another question and also comment. Um, Marcella says, thank you for sharing, Joe. You're a wonderful soul who is helping many. I'm fortunate enough to work with male youth at a local juvenile detention center and was wondering, had you not felt safe to come forward, what words could a counselor or educator have used to encourage you to seek support? <laughs> um. First of all, let me preface that by saying I did not feel safe go, uh, coming forward. Uh, for me, it was I wasn't sure where I was going to go with it, but I had, I just had to do something. So uh, what words that would have made me feel more comfortable, I, you know, that's really difficult. I can't really say that words themselves will make anybody feel more comfortable. I can only tell you that being personable, eye contact, uh, if possible, touching their hand, you know, obviously there are some security concerns with that, but, uh, you know, if it's possible to make some kind of physical contact, eye contact, uh, those things right there are huge. I know for me, we're, you know, the biggest foundation for me. And also, I'm Joe, just to jump in, I mean, you sent a, a note earlier, a comment here that, that just knowing that reporting is totally up to you, um, that that basic piece of information, even hearing that, look, it's your choice whether you report or not, if you could talk to a counselor ahead of time and they say, here's what, here's what may happen, here's the policies, this is your choice, that that actually could have, would have made you feel more comfortable to report as well. Well, just knowing it's it's your it's in your control. Yeah, because you know, for me, it, 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 especially immediately after the assault, uh, I felt completely out of control uh, mm -hmm. with my surroundings, with my body, with my psychology, my you know, with my head. Uh, I had no control of nothing. So, letting you know, letting me know that. I had some kind of control would have been helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and so if anyone has any more questions for Joe, please um, send them away. And uh, so here's another question for Linda or Vivian. Um, do prisoners not get any privacy when calling a hotline since it will be about a private sensitive matter? Privacy in the sense that it may be recorded, but away also away from other inmates or staff whom even may have been involved in any in the sexual assault that's being reported. So Linda, I think I'll um, go ahead and, and um, start this and then you can jump in. I think it really depends on the facility. Um, and then again, well, Linda said it's why it's so important to go and, and see the facility um, that you'll be working with. Some phones are just um, in, a, in a large cell on the wall and people are in line to use those. But these things can also be negotiated with each facility just to see, is there a place that, um, that we mentioned with attorney calls, is there a place that the uh, inmate can go and make the call this in the same way that they would an attorney call? Or um, is there some place that the phone is, you know, there's a phone that's used not as frequently that could be used for this? Um, Linda? Yeah, I think I mean I think that's absolutely right. Is is that um, the facilities vary a great deal 
Um, some places have phone booths that people can use that have um, sort of privacy screens, and some places it's just there. Some places, I think in one of the photos we showed, they actually have rolling phones that go cell to cell, so the person could still potentially be in their cell when they make a phone call, but they would have then to ask for the phone to be rolled there, so that would be a stretch, you know, that someone might be willing to ask for the phone. So really every facility is completely different. Um, I worked in a facility where there was one phone at the very end of a hallway, and so even though it was still out in a public area, that when people were using that phone, it was fairly private. So, um, but then if there is really nowhere to make a private call, I think negotiating um, around what possibilities are there is critically important. And again, remembering that um, many survivors may call just to say, I just want to to reaffirm that you're out there and they may not want to they may not be comfortable saying anything because they don't have privacy but knowing that you're there can still make a big difference to people thank you both of you and so I think we, we got another kind of specific question about a scenario which I think is important to mention here that's related to phone calls um, okay. one of our the advocates on our webinar right now just during the webinar took a took a call from an inmate a PREA call mm -hmm. Um, and the inmate stated that he had to ask for the PREA hotline to the, to the corrections officer who, who had yeah. violated him and was denied twice before okay. a sergeant let him make the phone call. How do we avoid that happening? And what can be done for folks who are being denied a PREA call? Well, I mean, I think the basic there is that there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of things wrong with, with that, right? <laughs> I um, know. And I mean, so I think the basic is that and and what the standards do require that these the contact with the rape crisis advocate be as confidential as possible, right? That it's it, that is a line in the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards, um, and that certainly to have to ask for that number to be dialed for you means that it's not a safe number to use. So I would say that that is a a sort of a misapplication of the intent of the standards and something that um, if you have any ability to advocate with or work with the facility to explain that you know this just means that people aren't going to most people aren't going to use it and the people who do use it um, are going to be putting themselves potentially at great risk to use it and um, yeah I would say that that is an absolute miss uh, application of the of the standard and, yeah. and definitely problematic and also it sounds like there might be a little bit of confusion at that facility as well between a reporting line because if it's something's like the PREA line that would mean that it, probably staff understand it as to make a report I would guess because the counseling hotline is supposed to should be available to all inmates whether they've made a report or not all residents um, of a youth facility or community corrections facility whether they've made a report or not and you know as we all know the majority a ma very high majority of people who are incarcerated have experienced some form of previous trauma in their lives so like, for example when I was doing direct services inside a prison I would say about half my caseload was people who had been sexually abused prior to being incarcerated. So they wanted to call a hotline or see a counselor about sexual abuse that happened um, in the community. And so to call it the pre-align isn't then also quite accurate. Right. And I've, so I've invited this advocate to email us um, about Definitely. this specific case. Um, and so, it, and that's available to anyone who has specific questions or requests for um, assistance um, that this link on our on the screen right now is um, you'll find an email address where you can lots more information and a form that you can submit questions and um, requests to um, so Joe I have a question from someone who asks was the perpetrator prosecuted uh, well Oh, uh, and feel free if if you don't want to answer this, feel free to just no. Say uh, no, I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, just kind of caught me off guard. I oh, I'm sorry. That one. Uh, yeah, I actually filed rape charges against the the perpetrator. Um, we went to court, and uh, the preliminary hearing court judge, even though there was DNA evidence, and uh, I was 
you know, willing to get on the stand and did get on the stand and testify against the perpetrator, the preliminary court judge decided that it was not a case of rape and that it was, they convicted him of consensual sex behind bars, which is, you know, BS, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I think many advocates um, out there will recognize that dynamic from other cases you've worked with where cases of um, domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual abuse get um, minimized down to some very different charge. And just so you know out there that, that you know, Joe is in California, and California is one of very few states that actually has penal code law on the books around sex with a confined person. Um, and just so people know, it, it is actually it's a misdemeanor. Uh, not a felony. Um, right. Many many states do not have that as a law, although it is against the rules in every single facility in the U.S. But I think that's a common dynamic, right? Of things getting sexual yeah. assaults getting getting bargained down to a much lesser a much lesser crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it diminishes yeah. the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Joe, for sharing. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Someone asks, if the SART exam is conducted in the facility, how is the chain of evidence being handled um, in terms of rape kit process, storage, victim notification? Great question. Um, so generally the ones where I've seen um, that the SART exam is being conducted inside the facility, they're working with the and that this is definitely best practice and, and required as a first step in the standards that you work with the community sexual assault response team. So it would be the forensic nurse uh, with from the community who works with law enforcement physically coming in. And again, as I mentioned, very much hopefully the advocate as well. And then the law enforcement agency that investigates um, would be the same law enforcement agency. So for example, if it's a city police department going into a uh, a county facility or a state facility, um, then that city police department would still be holding the evidence. So the chain of evidence, et cetera, should be the same. The exception to that would, of course, be is if you're in a community that there is no forensic examiner. And I know there are, you know, there are many communities across the country right now that are struggling with keeping forensic examiners. And in that case, um, then the chain of evidence would go straight to the investigating body. That, that whatever medical professional completes the kit, essentially, because um, then it would not necessarily be a full forensic exam, but more the completion of a kit, would follow those instructions and turn evidence over to the law enforcement agency. Great. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. If we didn't get to one of your questions or if you have an, a question you haven't asked, again, feel free to email us at advocate at justdetention.org. Um, and, and then there's also that form on this website up here on the screen. Um, so we'll cover in our next webinar, as we mentioned, um, we're going to cover uh, the logistics of providing in-person services, um, and that's on that webinar is on July Wednesday, July twenty third. This will include details about setting up this service and then troubleshooting. Um, and you'll be receiving an email with registration information soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation up here. The link is up here on the screen and provide us with your feedback. We really take your feedback very seriously. We will, um, our, for all of our future webinars, we, we adjust them based on um, a lot of your feedback. So please, that's very important to us. Um, the links up here on the slide and you'll also receive an email shortly with, um, with a link as well. Um, for additional information, please visit JDI's Advocate Resources page. Um, the link is up here on the website, justattention.org slash advocate hyphen resources. Um, and you can, again, you can direct questions to us at advocate at justattention.org. And we invite you to connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter as well. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.